right. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeremiah and thank him for uh, giving us this talk today. Jeremiah is a senior vice president and head of engineering at the automotive business at Qualcomm. In this role, he leads teams that define, develop, and productize chipsets and platform solutions for telematics, connectivity, infotainment, and ADAS. Prior to Qualcomm, Jeremiah was a fellow at Texas Instruments, leading SOC in systems architecture for DaVinci Media Processors, optimized for applications such as ADAS, security cameras, security DVRs, video telepresence, and IP set-top boxes. Jeremiah holds a bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering from Missouri University of Science and Technology and has more than 20 patents in the field of media processing architectures. Thank you, Jeremiah. Thanks, Vaishnav, and thanks everybody for being here. I'm looking forward over the next hour or so to share the journey we've been on at Qualcomm, working together with the automotive industry to help accelerate the intelligent connection, connected future of, of automotive. It's really been an active and exciting time in the automotive industry over the last decade. There's three major transformations that are occurring pretty much at the same time. One, cars are starting to be connected to the cloud. Second, you see the advent of automotive safety features and even transitioning to automotive dri automated driving. Uh, and then the third one is the move to electric vehicles. And all of those are leading to major transformations in the car and a huge amount of innovation that's all happening at the same time. So it's a pretty exciting time to be operating in the space and really needs a lot of the core technologies that we work on at, at Qualcomm. And it's provided a great opportunity for us to engage in this market. Um, so as we mentioned, the industry is really trying to accelerate and add these new technologies. And as part of doing that, the industry is working on moving to a new architecture. Electrification has been a key accelerant to this. I think many of you uh, own or have seen Teslas on the road. And Tesla came in with the opportunity to enter the market from scratch. And so they built up a ground up car that was really driven around software first. And other startups in the industry are doing the same thing. So it's a huge time now for the more established auto OEMs to really work on transforming their vehicle architectures that have been evolved over many, many years around the infrastructure that was built up around combustion industries, uh, combustion engines. Um, the key to all this is really defining an architecture that can be more software defined. So the ability to update software, have software over the air, upgrades, and to innovate quickly. And semiconductors and advanced uh, processors are really a core enabler for these technologies because as you add more and more capabilities, you have to be able to do that within the affordability envelope of the mainstream consumer. So you'll see these features come in early on in high-end tiers of cars, but for them to be adopted across a wider number of vehicles, it's really important to be able to bring the cost of adding these systems down. And for that, the automotive uh, makers have started to collaborate much more closely with technology providers. And in Qualcomm's situation, we've been part of one of those key technology providers that now is working very closely with OEMs um, because they know that to really be able to capture the full benefit of these technologies, they have to work really quick, closely with the innovators and the ones that are making these technologies a reality. So if you look at traditional architecture of a combustion engine car, it really evolved over many, many years with small distributed microcontrollers that were added to bring in electronics functionality. And over the years, there have been more and more systems added. Essentially, every time a new functionality was added, you'd add in a new electronic system. Uh, these take the form of what's called ECUs, electronic control units. And if you look at a typical car today, many of them have over 50 of these electronic control units. And a lot of these cars have over 100 microcontrollers in them. Um, so that makes it very difficult to be able to iterate quickly on these vehicles because you have many, many old processors, thousands of components. Uh, a lot of these are built with very small memory footprints. They weren't really designed to be continuously updated. And in the past, the cars weren't connected to the cloud, so it was very difficult to do software updates. 
What's happening now is that the industry is trying to gradually evolve into new architectures. In that previous diagram, you would have sensors in the car. So for example, one of the new areas of innovation in the car is advanced driver safety. And so many of you probably have cars with features like lane keep assist or anti-emergency braking. And those were added by adding a front camera ECU. And that ECU was a processor located in your rear view mirror that was sitting right there with the camera. But as these systems become more and more complex, and now I have not just one camera, but full surround vision and many cameras, and I need much more higher performance processors, becomes very difficult to locate that functionality all at the sensor. For one thing, if you put that processor in the rear view mirror, it's very difficult to have very large power budgets there because you can't really be cooling something that's present in that location of the car. Also, if you're sitting right next to the imaging sensor, it's very hard to have higher uh, power budgets there because that tends to become very hot and control the reliability of the sensor. So going forward, there's a desire to put the sensors on the edge and then you have high speed interfaces like ethernet or other certies in the car. And you would actually move that data into a central unit that then can have higher power budgets, better cooling, uh, and be able to process information from not just one sensor, but many sensors in the car. So this is what we call a, a zonal controller architecture where in different areas of the car, you would have uh, network distribution that then sends it to more centralized, higher performance compute systems. And in the previous diagram, we had basically where, the, where things are today. Um, you might have a centralized ECU that actually has multiple blades. So I could have an ADAS blade, uh, infotainment or a cockpit blade, and maybe some kind of uh, domain gateway controller. Um, and then moving forward, you could see over time as these functions start to get integrated, you could even imagine a, a situation where you have an array of computers that are really doing all kinds of processing that's not really constrained to one domain. So you could see ADAS and cockpit merge. You could see body controllers even get integrated over time. Now, what does this allow you to do? One of the goals of the industry is to move to what is referred to as a software defined vehicle. And that starts with the ability to do over the air upgrades to the car and the ability to deploy software, not just with what you have at the time that you buy the car, but you could be upgraded for new features. Um, you see that with some of uh, the cars like Tesla, where you might deploy with hardware, but the capabilities of like yourself driving get updated over the life of the car. So that adds a lot of capability and allows you to innovate a lot quicker. Um, the other thing that happens with the software defined vehicle is you wanna have a much cleaner abstraction between the hardware and the software so that it's much easier to upgrade and, and iterate and have compatibility over generations of vehicles um, and different models. You also have as part of that middleware that allows you to control multiple applications, basically have orchestration across many different functions. Uh, many OEMs are investing in their own car.os, which was really a set of application interfaces that give them a lot of flexibility to bring in a lot of applications from the cloud. Uh, and then finally, a lot of the OEMs are wanting to move to what they call a cloud native environment and even have the ability to have what we call digital twins. You'll see that a little bit later when I talk more about our ADAS solutions, but they might want to be able to replicate all the software that's running in the hardware in the car in a simulated environment in the cloud running on generic computer farms. So this is what the industry is moving toward and our platform solutions that we have at Qualcomm are part of enabling this and offering solutions that would allow customers to do this. So they would be able to test their systems in the cloud and then deploy them on our hardware, actually in vehicles. So the foundation of the software defined vehicle is all these advanced platforms for the key domains where a lot of the software differentiation is happening in the car. The first one for that, we call it our uh, Snapdragon auto connectivity platform, which is really where you bring in cellular communication to the car. 
And, and those ECUs typically also have your Bluetooth connectivity, also Wi-Fi connectivity as well. So that's really the gateway in the car that allows it to become upgradable over the air. And it gives you the ability to access a lot of data services and really a lot of the richness that will over time allow the car to evolve much more quickly. Um, the second area is the cockpit platform. And the cockpit traditionally was your old infotainment system, which was really what gave you your radio and then later it added navigation. Now it might add streaming media services. And over time, that cockpit platform became very powerful. It was driving not just the center display, but also your cluster. And we have systems that are driving now even up to 10 different displays off of one, one processor. Uh, and finally, the Snapdragon ride platform is part of the capabilities that the industry's uh, offering in terms of driver safety functions and moving to autonomous driving. At Qualcomm, we've been able to come in and, and help support some of the innovation in these areas because we have a very rich IP portfolio across the company. We call it our One Technology Roadmap. Uh, one of the unique things at Qualcomm is because of the scale we have in mobile and some of our broader markets, we have our own custom IP across all of the core subsystems of the car. We do custom CPUs, we have camera IP, we have graphics IP, we have computer vision IP, and the strategy of the company is we get one large scale of expertise on these core IP platforms. And then now, as the company is expanding broader to other markets, we can do customization on those areas and bring features on the same core base IP that are needed for specific markets. So in automotive, now that we've been at this for, for over a decade, we have a whole rich set of IP portfolio as well, built on top of our one foundation uh, technologies that are very specific to automotive. So when we first entered, for example, the digital cockpit space, we had to add automotive quality on top of all our core IPs and our safety infrastructure. To enter ADAS, we had to add safety, functional safety onto those IPs. Um, as part of our camera functions, now we have to have uh, much more uh, multi-camera operation for some of the ADAS functions. And we also have to offer 20-bit, 24-bit HDR to have the type of uh, uh, SNR that's needed to have high visibility uh, when it's dark and other features that are needed for ADAS. So what started as a, as a core set of IPs driven by mobile is now a very rich set of IPs where across all the different domains that Qualcomm plays, each is now able to offer best in class IP and move very quickly. So, We've been in this industry for a while now, and we essentially work across all the OEMs worldwide, all the major tier ones, and very actively involved with all of the major software ecosystem providers. And uh, it's really key to have collaborations in this market, and we'll give some examples of how to make things move even faster, we have very deep collaborations with ecosystem players and, and OEMs. So the start of Qualcomm's journey in automotive was in the early 2000s when we worked with GM and they were the first to offer cellular connectivity in the car. This was about 2002 and it was when Qualcomm was first trying to introduce CDMA technology and GM adopted what later became more broadly 2G and that was really the start of the OnStar service that they offered. And uh, so that's been about 20 years that we've been involved in the, in the telematics space. And uh, since then, we've expanded into a lot of areas in the car for connectivity, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. We also offer power line communication that's in most of the electrical vehicle charging systems that, that are used. Um, and on top of that, we have advanced location services. So we have GNSS actually integrated into our connectivity chips. Uh, and that becomes a very, critical function as well for some of the things we'll talk about in ADAS and, and other areas. Um, what started as a niche is now pretty widespread. There's over 250 me million vehicles on the road that have cellular connectivity. And today, over 50% of the new vehicles that ship come equipped with uh, cellular technology. And many of those are already moving to 5G. So this really sets the foundation for the software defined vehicle and the ability to have the connectivity to data in the cloud and a lot of the services that we'll talk about 
throughout the rest of this, this presentation. Um, one key investment area that we've had at, at Qualcomm that many of us are very uh, proud of and committed to, and this is still evolving, is cellular V to X. So this is an area we've been, been investing in for over a decade in standards and forming the foundation. Uh, CV to X operates in the 5.7 gigahertz spectrum. And it really offers vehicles the ability to communicate to other vehicles and infrastructure without going through um, you know, the cellular network. And this gives you the ability to have very low latency communication. And uh, this can communicate to other vehicles. It can com communicate to roadside units and the infrastructure. And it also, in the future, could even allow you to communicate to uh, pedestrians through the, the communications that they have on their phone that they have in their in their pocket. So this is really something that's still in the early phase in the industry, but we believe this could bring a lot of value into, into the whole uh, vehicle infrastructure and, and could really lead to smart transportation in the future. So here's a couple of examples of some of the big potential for this technology. Uh, the one that's my favorite is to really offer non-line of sight uh, visibility and sensing. So you could imagine all of us have seen the scenario where there's a car that's coming from the uh, lane that we can't see. And if someone's running a red light and our light's green, we don't have the ability to know that's happening until it's almost too late. But with VDEX technology, if that car was uh, transmitting its location, you could actually get an early warning that someone's running the red light and that you should be careful. Now, one of the challenges that CV to X has is, is the network effect. So even if I have V to X in my car, it's gonna be a long time before all the other vehicles have it as well. So one of the other angles we're pursuing in this is to add V to X technology in the roadside infrastructure. And many cities are doing early pilots and trials on this. Uh, we've had a lot of trials in, in, in school, you know, warning zones. And you can imagine here, you could combine this with the roadside unit in your traffic light with the AI uh, intelligent camera. And it could actually be detecting the car that's gonna run the red light and broadcasting the information. So if I have VDX in my car, I could get the warning signal even if the car that's running the light doesn't have it. So. You know, this is an example of a long-term investment. Uh, this is starting to build momentum in China. There's quite a few different OEMs that have launched vehicles that are equipped with our cellular VDEX technology. Uh, and one good development is in 2024, they're planning to start to offer some of the safety rating points in the China NCAP based on features that would be requiring to have CVDX to offer it, like some of the ones that are on this, this slide. So anyway, something to keep an eye on, but I'm very excited about when this becomes a reality uh, because one of the most exciting things we could do in, in automotives is anything that would make it safer. And this is one that actually allows you to do something that even a human driver can't do because it's not gonna be able to ever anticipate something that's beyond its vision. And even automated driving with all the AI and sensing capability that we'll talk about later in the presentation can't address this kind of situation, but VDAX can. Um, as part of our connectivity platform and to make it easier to leverage connected services, we're starting to offer not just the chipsets, but a lot of software that makes it easier to connect to telematics applications and connect to services in the cloud. So we have a couple of modules, our telematics application framework, makes it very easy to plug in new applications without having to go develop all of the middleware that goes under that. Uh, and then the second one is our car to cloud offering. So that starts with a, uh, a car to cloud client that runs on the edge in our connectivity devices. And then you have a car to cloud application that's actually in, in the cloud network. And once you do that, you can start to enable a whole set of connected services in the car. And it's many, many endless applications that you could offer here. As part of that software-defined vehicle architecture, you create basically um, application layers that uh, software-oriented architecture that allows you to create APIs that can be the same in the vehicle and on the cloud. And then those APIs are very easy for application developers to develop services around 
without knowing any of the details of the hardware that's in the car. Uh, some examples of this could be fleet management. So you could have the ability to see the location of your car and in the cloud you're monitoring that. You could know if the car has had an accident or some event and you could activate emergency services. Uh, many, many applications that you could do with this. Um, and also your, uh, your customer relationship manager that the OEM has. So if your car has any early signings of a warning of a failure in the car, it can give you early warnings. The car could indicate uh, service providers that could deal with that situation without you even having to go into a dealer and, and get it a diagnosis for it. So this is something we're really excited about. Um, we've got our first uh, customer wins that are actually going to be using active services here through our, our Carter Cloud network. And it's going to be very interesting to see how this evolves over the next few years. Um, the next area that we entered was the, the cockpit space. And we started on this about a decade ago. And the idea was to take our application processors, the Snapdragon uh, application processors that are in mobile, and take those into broader markets. And one of the first ones that we were successful in was taking this into the automotive space. Uh, it started with the target to enter the infotainment space, but over the years, this became what we call the digital cockpit, because instead of just driving the one center infotainment display, now in many cases, we're driving many, many displays throughout the, the car. And this is really all about bringing rich in-cabin experiences. And you can see each generation, there's been more and more functionality added into the cockpit. Uh, about the time of our second generation, we had all of the customers coming and wanting to do something which was a first in the industry, which was I want to offer a hypervisor and have a multi-OS environment so that I can start to combine safety critical information. Like at that time, the cluster had regulations that said you're uh, telltale warnings in your car can't ever fail. You have to know if, if there's an issue in your display. And your odometer, if you make that a digital odometer, you can't ever drop a frame. It has to be smooth. And you have to have hooks in your architecture to make sure that you would never drop a frame or never end up with uh, a, a bad display when you're doing these types of things. Uh, in the meantime, you wanted to still run on the same processor your infotainment workloads, which at that time were starting to move to Android environments and a lot of things that were much less hardened and you know not as reliable from a safety standpoint. So what we did is we, in our second generation, started to offer hypervisors, and this was very successful actually. And now we've been two or three generations now of doing this. And what it's allowed us to do is every generation we've integrated more functionality into that same cockpit platform. In the first generation, it was all about just giving higher resolution displays in the infotainment. Uh, at that time, even a VGA display in your infotainment was still uh, pretty high resolution. And we came in and started offering 1080p type displays. And uh, when we went to the second generation, this is when the hypervisor came in and people wanted to run the cluster and the infotainment off of the same SOC. Uh, that allows you to have richer graphics on the cluster, and it would lower the cost of having that high performance graphics in the cluster because you wouldn't have to offer two higher performance SOCs into the same car. Uh, the cluster was considered safety critical, so that was where we started to do the, the uh, hypervisor. So we had the hypervisor, and then we would have a QNX runtime, and then a, a Linux or an Android VM. And the surround view and your driver monitoring and some of those functions that would come in later, but inf instrument cluster in the first systems, ran on QNX, and then your infotainment would run on Android. And what we had to demonstrate at that time is that the Android could crash, and you would never drop a frame on your cluster that was running on QNX. Uh, so this was really a breakthrough moment because it led to a whole bunch of integration in the future as we started to add more and more applications in, into the single processor. Um, in the next generation, we had already added the cluster, but then we added um, all around view monitoring, which was your surround view. 
Surround view cameras originally came in as a separate ECU, but that added a lot of cost and it was only in high-end vehicles. Now we could add the surround view basically into the same chip and it becomes a much cheaper function to offer. And I would imagine most of the cars that you would buy today, that any of us would buy, would have surround view equipped in them. Um, AR HUDs was also a new feature at the time. So many of you have seen the cars where it will display on your windshield, your navigation turn by turn. All of that is driven off of the same chip that's also driving the infotainment and the cluster. Uh, and then rear seat entertainment was an optional feature where you would have additional monitors in the back of your car for your children to play games or, or have other capabilities uh, for entertainment in the car. So you can see how this took at a time. We've had certain chips when we deployed them where that one chip was replacing nine different ECUs of functionality from the previous generation. And, and that's how you start to see more and more functionality added in a, in a mainstream car in the next generation, which would have been a much more expensive car in, in the prior generation. In the current generation that we're offering, our fourth gen, we've started to add even more capabilities. So with autonomous driving, a lot of cars add the driver monitoring integrated into the cluster. That's also something that in the early days was a separate ECU on its own. Um, and then in the future, we're now starting to talk how your basic in-cap capabilities for driver safety eventually could also be integrated in the infotainment system. And if you did that, that would become even more mainstream. Essentially, almost every car that gets deployed would have that capability. So here's some examples of different cars that have been deployed over the last couple of years with the cockpit system, just to bring it a little bit more to the real world. Uh, this is the latest uh, BMW i7, and you can see really large uh, center display and the digital cluster. And in the back seat of the car, you have a, a very large display that can be uh, downloaded. It, it can move down where you can see it in, in the rear seat of the car. Uh, huge display and, and really, really cool feature in the, in the BMWs. Um, this is the Mercedes E-Class, and this is an awesome looking car. Full panoramic display across the entire front of the car. And these displays, you've seen displays where the, the panoramic display is flat. These are very contoured, very stylish. And uh, one of the things we did in our third generation is we had a, a design that wanted to offer 15K wide of resolution on the, on the front display. It was spanning three panels. And it required us to bond multiple display ports to get that full resolution. These panels are typically not your traditional resolutions because they're, they're much wider. They have a, a very low aspect ratio. So they're very wide horizontally and not as, as high in, in the height. Uh, but this has been a real big breakthrough to be able to deliver such rich displays. And, and we have systems, as we said, that one chip is driving over eight different displays. Some of the new applications coming is your mirrors that add draft and wind resistance to the car, over time could become electric uh, mirrors that just have displays for the camera. Then that will be much more fuel efficient and you could have basically no blind sight at that point. Uh, we have many, many launches in China. Uh, we were just in China in, in May and we had over 30 vehicles on display with our, our third generation uh, cockpit chipset. And all of these have massive uh, rich displays. Um, this one was a really cool car from Li Auto. You can see it also has a large display in, in the back seat. And one of the features that I, I didn't ever think I would appreciate very much was a lot of times we would talk about uh, gesture control in the car. And I was thinking, why do you need gesture controls in the car? That wouldn't actually be very practical if you were driving. But I saw this car and it really made me realize gestures could be pretty neat because imagine your kids sitting in the back seat and you have this display up high. They're not going to be in a position to really be reaching out and doing a touch screen to control it. And with gestures, it was very intuitive to, to play games and do different things on, on the screen. Uh, the innovation level in China right now in the cockpit is extremely fast and it's just amazing the level of uh, entertainment capability that's being offered in the car. 
Um, the next uh, frontier, I think, in these cockpit systems and in cars is really getting into generative AI. And obviously across the whole industry, generative AI is, is a new area. And one of the things that can happen in the car is really the goal to have essentially almost like a virtual assistant in the car. It knows all the context of what's going on in your car. It knows your daily habits. It knows your routines. It knows your calendar. And it can really be a bridge that does all of your scheduling and helps you very quickly react to things that you need to do in your day. Um, and a couple of different types of models, the text-to-text -text conversational AI. Uh, we're going to be demonstrating Llama uh, with 7 billion parameters running on the edge in the car. And then we also have text to image with things like, like stable diffusion. Uh, but really what you want here is a whole pipeline and, and you need an orchestrator. So this would actually start with uh, natural language processing with speech to text so that you could just speak naturally to it. And then you would imp impose the text to text with the, the Llama generative AI networks. And your orchestrator can make all this interconnected with your calendar, your schedule, reservation systems, the ability to pay for bookings at a restaurant or pre-purchasing things at the grocery store. So we've got a quick uh, video that shows some examples of some of the capabilities that, that we could offer with generative AI. If the team can queue up uh, the video. Hey, Snapdragon, find me a recipe for chicken enchilada. I found a recipe for chicken enchilada. Would you like to add the ingredients to the shopping app? Yes. OK, they are added and will be ready for pickup on your way home. So that's just a, a quick example, but you can imagine the power of this. Um, and we have many, many uh, similar demos like this that we run in our concept car. And, uh, you know, it could even adapt dynamically. So I, I do a booking at a restaurant and I want to sit out outside and I create a reservation. And then all of a sudden it starts raining and it knows that really I don't want to go to the restaurant anymore. It cancels my reservation automatically. It reroutes me to go home. So all of the interaction which you might be doing today with maybe your phone that's being projected in a projected screen, this can get so much richer if those capabilities are integrated natively in the car. It has access to all the sensors on the car, all the information that, that you're doing. So this is the vision that the automotive industry has, and, and we're really working hard to make that a reality. Okay, the next phase of our entry into automotive was to start to participate in the ADAS market. And we had been wanting to do this for quite some time. We started in 2016 with some of our R&D groups developing a full automated highway pilot stack that ran on our Snapdragon processors at the time. Uh, and by CES in 2019, we were demonstrating full highway pilot running on multiple of our Snapdragon cockpit processors. Um, and we had a lot of uh, interest from our customers because in the cockpit space, they had seen that we had low power, high compute solutions, and we had chips that scaled all of the tiers of the car. So at the time, if you went and looked at most of the uh, ADAS systems, they were really driven by sort of very targeted lower tier computer vision chips, or you had the very high end GPUs and x86s that were being used in the robotaxi demonstrators. But there really wasn't a solution that could scale all the way from a low tier NCAP system up to a full L2 plus or L3 system. And it, this is very expensive market for the OEMs because you have to invest a lot in algorithms and machine learning and training. And each one of these architectures have processors that require a lot of tuning to really get the full performance for the, the perception algorithms and all the other aspects that are involved in delivering these systems. Um, so one of the goals for Qualcomm in getting involved was to offer an open platform that had all the high performance for AI and machine learning, but it could be scalable from an entry level system all up to the high end system. And uh, so in 2019, we, we started working on this. In 2020, 
we got our first design win with GM and we announced that we were entering. And uh, this was really, you know, the start of a, a journey that we're still on now. And we decided our strategy for this was to create a common architecture that could span both cockpit and the ADAS and autonomous driving applications because we saw that these would eventually merge. And there was a lot of commonality and both needed machine learning, both needed a lot of camera processing, both needed a lot of CPU. Um, so we launched what we called our Snapdragon Ride Flex SOC. And it's really building on that mixed criticality framework that we showed earlier, where we can have hypervisors, multi-BVM, a mix of safety critical and non-safety critical uh, functions. Um, and our Gen 4 system that we, we introduced uh, at that time uh, had all the functionality that was needed to offer functional safety, which is a key requirement for the ADAS market. Um, there's standards called ASLB that monitor the level of uh, resilience you have to random defects that happen in silicon from alpha particles. You need to have very robust uh, procedures in your process for designing the system and your software so that you can understand how you have and deal with any kind of fault that could happen in the system. And there's a key uh, block that we added at that time in the car, which was a safety island into this chip. Um, this has lockstep R52 processors, and that block can actually boot independently of the main CPU on the device. And it actually serves two functionalities. It's an error manager, so all the other blocks have error reporting. So if there's any kind of uh, functional error that happens in the, in the circuits or in the software, it'll trigger errors that are then monitored by this robust uh, fault tolerant uh, safety island. It also serves as the interface to a lot of the core uh, buses in the car, like the CAN bus, the Ethernet, and, and all of that. So it gives you a, a very reliable and, and resilient block that essentially is mir mirroring what a microcontroller would have done externally in, in the vehicle. Uh, as part of this, we also had to add all of the core capabilities across all the other IP subsystems. So for example, we mentioned that uh, the ISP or the image signal processor um, the sensors that are used for the uh, ADAS cameras need 140 dB of SNR. And so that requires 24-bit HDR capability in the data path. So that was a new thing. You know, our typical smartphone ISPs at the time had about 12-bit, and today that's moved to about 14 to 16-bit. Um, also, we needed to be able to interface up to 11 cameras concurrently. So we needed to have a lot more data paths there. Uh, also, other blocks, like we have a, a, a computer vision block that has a dense optical flow that's used for quick reaction to changes in the scene. Um, many, many features were added here, but this gives us now all the capability to have a common platform. And we have different SKUs of the part that can be used for cockpit, SKUs that can be used for ADAS, and then flex in the future will be SKUs where you can combine ADAS and cockpit into the same chip. Um, so, as I said, we started in this business uh, with our first chip was introduced in, in 2020. Uh, that first design win with GM has now launched, and they had, uh, last year, they came out with the Super Cruise on our, our uh, 8540 SOC, and then next year they're coming out with the Ultra Cruise. Uh, the Ultra Cruise is basically going to offer capability to drive basically like from your home to work, all on self-driving. Uh, if you have a route that you understand that's been mapped and that you know all the circumstances, it gives you hands-free driving in those conditions. Uh, for that system, we have the same SOC, two of them, plus an AI accelerator that's also a ASLB level accelerator that has the same uh, NSP architecture for machine learning. Um, over the, next, over the last couple of years, we've been looking to extend our offering another level. There was a whole series of customers that didn't want to invest in their own camera perception stack. Uh, a lot of the market had gone to taking black box solutions from providers that had chips that were just a, an integrated package with the full stack. And so we did an acquisition of a, of a company uh, that spun out of Veneer that, that was Arriver was the entity. 
and uh, so we brought in that team and now we have a full production level in cap stack and the idea is that can be bundled with our SOCs and it still gives the customer the ability to integrate their own drive policy some of their own other functions like driver monitoring and, and the, the parking stack but the the camera perception is is an in cap proven solution so we call that our snapdragon ride vision and then we have another level of offering where we can integrate also the full autonomous driving stack. And I'll talk in a couple of slides about a collaboration we have there to offer a full product level uh, drive policy as well. Um, so looking at the scalability of the, the camera perception stack, uh, right now we have three different tiers of offerings. Uh, the Ride Vision High can give you uh, five camera perception. So that gives you surround view, plus the front camera. And uh, then we have the Ride Vision Mid, which also offers the, the five camera uh, with a little bit of a, a middle tier type level of solution. And at the low, we have a one to two camera solution. So these would offer different levels of, of in-cap capability, uh, depending on the tier of vehicle that, that you were looking at. Um, and the baseline system has up to five cameras. And you can see that the front camera, these have all moved to eight megapixels. Uh, the previous generation was typically two megapixel sensors, but with eight megapixel, it gives you over 150 meters of visibility from the front camera. So that allows you to run at higher speeds and react much quicker to, uh, to oncoming traffic and any hazards that might be there. Another thing that's happening in these systems to keep it fairly low cost is it's reusing the camera sensors, the fisheye uh, cameras that are already there for surround view. So a lot of the basic cars already have surround view, and these are used for your parking stack as well. Now that can be used for camera perception as well. And this allows you on the highway to have a full 360 surround view that allows you to support lane changes. So that's kind of becoming a mainstream configuration that we'll offer uh, on the base packages. And then moving forward, you can imagine a hiring vehicle might have up to 11 cameras. And the 11 cameras would use not just the, the surround view cameras, the fisheye lenses, but it would have wing cameras that are more optimized for uh, further distance and have they're placed better on the sides of the car to give you a wider set of uh, 360 perception. And then on the front camera, you would have uh, a wide field of view camera and a narrow field of view that would give you even further distance of, for the perception. So just a look at uh, the autonomous driving stack, it starts with the camera perception. And today, a lot of these systems would have, let's say six or seven cameras, and each of those cameras would do their own perception. Uh, and then you would also have radar that has perception being done integrated with the sensor. And then the radar would give objects, the camera perception would give objects, and then that would feed into a sensor fusion block that combines the information from all the different sensors and tries to take the best decisions, understanding the weaknesses of each sensor. Um, this is a very rapidly evolving field. And as we speak now, uh, the next generation of camera stacks are all moving to a bird's eye view, where instead of doing the perception on each camera individually, you would actually create a bowl view across the 360 uh, fusion of the cameras. And then you would do the perception on actually the 360 uh, source directly. And then in the future, we believe the market will move to what's called low level perception, where instead of doing object based perception uh, on the radar and then feeding that to a sensor fusion block, both the raw camera data and the raw sensor data would actually feed into a low level perception network where the network itself is combining radar and all the cameras and doing the perception. So really, really a time of quick changes in, in the machine learning and the networks that are being run on these systems. Um, that's one of the reasons we're investing in our own stack, because if we want to offer best in class SOC technology, we have to understand these core algorithms inside out. It lets us understand how to optimize our machine learning accelerators and offer all the core blocks, whether we're going to productize our own stack and offer that or for OEMs that are also wanting to have best-in-class silicon technology. Um, 
The result of the sensor fusion or the level of perception is an environmental model, which gives you a full 360 degree view of all the objects around the car that it needs to know for then creating how to drive and, and to move forward. Um, so there's a block called the, the drive policy that has basically behavior prediction and planning. It'll predict what's going to happen with all the vehicles that are around the Ego vehicle. And then it plans how to carry out the maneuvers that it needs to do to drive the, the path that it desires to go down. I mean, then that feeds into motion planning, which is really feeding the actuation of the car. So the motion planning would be very specific to each e vehicle and the actuations and the microcontrollers that do the, the drive control of that particular car. So this is a look at uh, the camera perception, a typical view of what would be happening on the highway. So you would basically detect the, the lane that you're in and, and mark that out so you know the path in front of you. It would detect all the vehicles and motorcycles and trucks around the vehicle. Uh, it would detect the lanes and you could have bounding boxes around the cars. You can see it knows the, uh, the distance to each of the vehicles. Um, and uh, so this would be the output of the camera perception. It also detects all the traffic signs. If this was an urban environment, you'd be detecting all the pedestrians and, and all those areas as well. Um, the radar is powerful because it has a much more accurate depth perception. And with the Doppler, it can also detect very quickly the change in acceleration of the vehicles in front of you. So one of the reasons you would want to fuse with radar is it will give you combined with the camera perception, a much more accurate and, and reactive result to, uh, to changes in speed by the vehicles around you and know the distances. Uh, one of the issues with radar though, is it's very noisy. So, uh, you know, I mentioned in the past today, radar systems are still the old distributed architecture. So typically the uh, processor that's controlling radar and doing the perception is tied to the, the box with the sensor. Um, which is okay, but you can actually do an even better job of detecting the objects from the radar if you have more powerful processing. So this is showing what you can do with uh, machine learning operating on the raw radar signal. And what we've done here is we have a, a bounding box that gives you the depth of the, of the vehicles from the radar signal. And it knows how to discard all of the random uh, pings that maybe aren't tied to, to real objects. And here, if, if I do my sensor fusion and combine radar and camera, now I have very tight 3D bounding boxes that also have very accurate distance measurements for all of the, the different objects. So this is one of the reasons you would do the, the sensor fusion and use a different set of modalities with both camera and uh, radar. Um, so all of this then would feed into a full 3D environmental model that can feed into the drive policy. So you can see here's my Eagle vehicle, and it has a model with all of the vehicles that are around you. Uh, it knows their rough speed, it knows the distance. And uh, so if I'm planning to do a maneuver, like we're gonna show a clip and the car knows that it's getting ready to need to change lanes because it wants to exit the freeway. So how am I gonna do a lane change? Do I know when I have enough distance with the cars that are driving behind me to be able to safely maneuver and change lanes. So let's look at a, a short video of the drive policy at work. So here's my free space and I'm detecting the sign for the exit that I want. So I'm trying to now plan to be able to uh, exit. And you can see here, I want to go into this lane and I'm monitoring that I have the ability to do that safely. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more complexity than you can see in this video, uh, but we have all this running and it's very robust, you know, once you have it fully tuned and, and very human-like in terms of the driving behavior. So one of the things we did in, in 2021 is uh, I mentioned that collaborations and working with the ecosystem is, is really important in terms of speeding up the, the pace of innovation. And we decided to enter a collaboration with uh, BMW to jointly develop a full product level 
uh, drive policy stack. And at the time, they also selected to uh, use Qualcomm's offering with our arrival acquisition to use our camera perception stack. So this collaboration involves us delivering the full camera perception block. And then we're working together on the drive policy and all the other layers of the AD stack. Uh, and we'll introduce this to the market as a full product in BMW cars in 2025. Uh, but we'll also fully own the stack and be able to offer it to other OEMs. Uh, the reason collaborations like this are important is for you to deliver a robust uh, AD stack, you literally need millions of miles of testing. So that's very expensive to do. But with a collaboration like with BMW, we'll be able to share all the data from their vehicles on the road. It gives us massive scale and testing and the ability to really harden this and create a product that's very robust. Uh, and so, you know, we've had highway pilot demos through our R&D group for years, but that's very different than having a full safety qualified product that's been tested all over the world. And right now we're doing data collection in over 60 different companies, uh, countries and literally hundreds of thousands of miles that are being generated to go create all the corner cases that need to be offered to deliver a product level uh, stack for these functions. Uh, let's tee up a video here that just gives you a sneak preview of the collaboration we're doing with, with BMW. doing and what you might expect to see on the road in a couple of years. And uh, this industry really benefits a lot from tight partnerships and, and collaboration, and we're really excited about the work we're, we're doing with, with BMW. Um, this is just a preview of all the different levels of scalability of the stack. Like I mentioned earlier, the, the baseline is a five camera system. And on top of that five camera, we have five radars. So that's the baseline configuration. Um, in China, you'll see a lot of the deployments that are doing urban automated driving also add LiDAR. So in 2026, we'll be adding LiDAR to the system and we'll have an 11 camera configuration with eight to nine uh, radars and one LiDAR. Uh, these LiDARs that are being deployed are not like the, the rotating 360 mechanical LiDARs you see like in a, a Waymo or Cruise RoboTaxi. Uh, those are very expensive and they're hard to maintain over the lifetime of a vehicle. These are more like solid state LIDARs that are distributed with directional LIDARs across uh, the car. So uh, this particular LIDAR would be uh, on the front of the car and it would give you much more accuracy and distance tracking uh, to be able to react very quickly, for example, to pedestrians on the road and, and other hazards that you have to be very aware of in urban driving. One of the, the big key things about this whole market and uh, machine learning in general is it's all about data. Uh, and I mentioned the massive amounts of data collection that we're going to do to deliver a full product level data stack. Uh, and what's happening is that's really driving the need to have some of the attributes I mentioned earlier, uh, the digital twin, you know, the cloud native. And uh, BMW in particular in their previous generation had an on 
prem uh, reprocessing factory. So they had compute farms and, and storage all on their premises, and they could basically replicate the whole car you know, on those farms. But it becomes very difficult to maintain. And you can imagine one of these systems, we're one of the suppliers to BMW, but they have literally hundreds of suppliers. And you can imagine trying to maintain an on-prem that does has physical hardware for every system that you're deploying in the car. So what they want to go now is to basically a simulation environment in the cloud that can in software emulate all of the hardware that's in the vehicle. And so each supplier then has to offer simulation environments that can run in the cloud. So for example, our platform that we're working on with BMW, we offer a, a simulated version of our camera ISP you know, of the networks that are running uh, on our accelerators. And they can literally run the whole stack in software on the cloud. Now, as we do that, and you're going to be running massive amounts of data, you have to actually also think about the cost of running all that. So it can become very expensive. So one of the next moves that happens is you can actually add hardware accelerators into the cloud as well. So just like today in the cloud, you might have GPU accelerators. Uh, we've now are working with some of the, the cloud hyperscalers to add Snapdragons in the cloud as well. So as part of this simulation factory, we'll be able to run in software all of the functions, but for example, some of the perception tasks could actually be offloaded to Snapdragons in the cloud, and that gives us a very limbo way uh, to do what's called reprocessing. So as you iterate on your software, you can regress through all of the data that you're doing to test your camera perception and make sure that you're never regressing and that you always meet all the KPIs that you need. Uh, as part of your doing that, data management's really important. You know, you collect hundreds of thousands of miles, but at some point you don't really want to be regressing over all of that data. So when you collect the data, you want to be able to have a data ingestion pipeline that marks and annotates all of it. So then you can basically do a lookup and say, I want to test on all of the trucks or all of the traffic signs in China or you know, particular areas that you have trouble with. That way you can make your regressions much more targeted and not have to continually regress over data that's not really testing new capability that you need to do. So this whole pipeline is something that's being put in place and a very essential part of uh, these types of, of development flows. Um, and three other things I wanna highlight that are really important. Uh, one is called active learning. So one of the problems in autonomous systems is really the long tail. So you can literally dive for millions of miles, but you may have something that you've never encountered before. And it's very difficult to actually capture that. And so how do you manage that? And one of the best ways to do that is to actually have the ability for the vehicles in the road, and they can actually detect something that they don't understand and don't know how to deal with. And instead of uploading tons of data constantly from the car. You could only capture things that you really need to collect that are mining things of interest. So here, for example, one of the, the challenging areas uh, in vehicles has been trucks. So flatbed uh, trailers, for example, have been one of the causes of several of the accidents that you've seen in, in the autonomous driving space. And uh, with this, you could basically constantly be collecting these different versions of, of trucks and anomalies that, that don't fit and can't be handled by your perception. Um, and then you would very quickly be able to train and cover all these corner cases. Um, the middle scenario here is what we call the ground truth measurement. So the way this worked typically in the past, a lot of the early ADAS systems that did uh, perception weren't machine learning based, they were based on computer vision and you would have rule-based algorithms. Uh, but those were very difficult to maintain over time because there were so many corner cases, so you'd constantly be adapting. Uh, once you go to machine learning, the problem then becomes to have a rich enough data set that covers all the cases. And one of the problems you have is to train, you have to basically have annotated content that actually shows what the reality is. What are the objects in the, in the, in the images? And in the past, when it was 2D content, this was usually done by paying 
you know, companies to go and manually annotate it. But what's happened now with the complexity of having to do 3D bounding boxes and the really uh, detail that you need to do in the annotation, uh, manual annotation is too expensive and not accurate enough. So what people are having to do now is actually create uh, basically very high, you know, not compute bounded uh, machine learning algorithms that can do the annotation automatically. And uh, one of the ways to do that is to use LIDAR as the source because LIDAR has much richer information. And you can basically train on the LIDAR and then correlate that to the, the camera domain and that becomes your training environment. Uh, originally, that's how we were doing it, but then we realized that you do have to also use the camera data for some types of training. For example, traffic signs would not be something you could train off of LiDAR. So right now we're working on an automated ground truth that's a fusion of, of camera plus, plus LiDAR. Uh, the third area is synthetic data collection. So a lot of the companies are using this now. So if you had to train, especially your drive policy on the road, that's very challenging to do because there's so many corner cases and you really can't afford to be on the road until you've robustly tested all the corner cases. So we have simulation environments that can take and trigger all kinds of different corner cases. And you could take a base simulation and then have it render in all kinds of different lighting conditions. You could add bad weather, and that becomes a very effective way to do simulation and speed up the training of, of these models. Okay, so we've gone through a lot of the areas that we've worked on, and the end result is that we now are pretty far down the journey of moving into the central compute domain. And this gives us a pretty optimal architecture to move to the software-defined vehicles that the OEMs are, are wanting. Uh, and the state of the industry today with the, the flex architecture that we have, many OEMs are down the, the road of adding these centralized blades. And the way this might look like today is you may have an OEM that has a, a central compute that has a dedicated ADAS card and a data dedicated cockpit card. Those might both be Snapdragon processors, but they have the same development environment. You're using the same machine learning tools, so it makes it very easy to scale from a development standpoint. Um, and the Flex might come in in a, in a low tier car where you might combine the cockpit and the ADAS, and then at a very high tier uh, scale where you move to an L3 type system, you might add a redundant blade and you might add an AI accelerator. So this gives us a lot of scalability to go all the way from a low tier system. You can imagine that uh, a low tier system might be a cockpit with integrated level one, level two ADAS. You go to a level two plus where you might have a full cockpit and, a, and an ADAS card. And then the level three might add an additional blade with the cockpit plus ADAS and basically an accelerator card. So one common development environment, but the ability to scale across tiers which was one of the original goals we had to working with OEMs. All right, so that's what I wanted to share. And with all this, we really are down the path of enabling the car of the future. You can see that the cars are becoming much more autonomous and uh, you know, a very large percentage of the cars on the road are, are connected. And it's really exciting to see how this will happen. And I think all of us enjoy driving these new cars that have these rich experiences. And you should expect that there'll be a lot more continued advances you know, over the next several years. All right, thank you. Uh, one of the concerns I had with is this on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the concerns I had was, or, or I'm just wondering about, is the development cycle for releasing cars, new models of cars, since it's so tied to software development and the quality and reliability of it and that sort of thing. Do you see that increasing the the time for new models to come out because of the complexity 
not just because you're you're integrating all the systems, you, you're fusing them, but then also this each individual module or or capability itself has to go through some rigorous testing. So yeah. do, you, do you see that uh, causing the the cycle to increase, at least in the immediate uh, near term, and then maybe in the future could speed up or something? Yeah, very good question. And the answer is sort of how you alluded at the end. It, it's really a mixed bag. So if you offer it, look at the companies that are starting from scratch and they basically have defined the car from the ground up as a software defined vehicle and these companies have been formed really as software companies not as hardware companies you'll see those companies moving very fast and they iterate very quickly uh, and they have the benefit that they're basically designed that way already and they're not gating every feature in the car by getting it all test it all at once and, and everything is, is done before you ship um, because they can iterate even after the car is launched by adding new capabilities. Uh, on the other hand, you have a lot of established players that are really transforming now from hardware companies to having to offer these rich software development environments. And there we do see challenges because the programs are really complex. It's a big transformation you know, for the OEM to move from these distributed systems to these centralized compute with hypervisors and all the complexity that goes with that. And so there, we do see that some of these programs, the early ones do get delayed a little bit, take a little bit longer. But as they get used to this cycle, I think you'll see things speed up. And a good benchmark is to look at what's happening in China with some of the OEMs we, we work with there. A traditional cycle would be that we would have about a year of engagement with the OEM as part of a competition to win the socket. And then after that, you would have about three years from the start of the program to when it deployed. And a contrast to that is we have opportunities in China now where we engage and literally one year after we start the program, they're deployed. So that's kind of the range of, of the cycle. Yeah. So it will speed up in general, but in the meantime, you see some of these where there's big foundational changes and it requires new ways of working at these companies. It, it does take a little bit longer. I also had a question about uh, data because you talked about how there's so much data. Now, um, there's the issue of, of not just the security and the privacy aspects, but who owns it, uh, who sees it, what are the licensing agreements uh, and controls on that? Uh, so there must be a lot of legal issues around surrounding that, especially when you're talking about an international uh, vehicle. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of complexity there. Uh, even right now, as we do the data collection, you know, we have to make sure as we collect data that it's nominalized and that we don't have visibility to individuals, for example, as part of the data collection. And every country has its own set of regulations. So there's a ton amount of complexity there. In terms of the ownership of the data, it's, it's definitely complicated because you have the owner of the car and the OEM and potentially software providers that are providing the solutions that are in the, in the, the solution. So um, yeah, a lot of complexity there. Um, but a lot of those things need to get worked through because that's all part of creating this rich environment where you really can capture the value of the data and deliver these services that really add a lot of value to the user. We, we have another question there, Mike. Yeah, I have two questions. This first question dovetails with what he just asked. Uh, you had a slide that showed a stack of the car at the bottom of the skateboard. Yeah. So there's several levels of software there. In which of those levels would you most opportunity for people who are doing open source software? I know Qualcomm wants to become a major player in open source software that's coming up next month. Which of those levels is, are the ones that uh, would have most opportunity for programmers around the world to contribute? Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to give a generic answer, but I think quite a few of the layers can. So for example, one of the initiatives we're looking at is to go more and more to, to Linux. And you saw that right now, a lot of our ADAS systems, for example, use a, a QNX based hypervisor and a QNX RTOS. Um, but in the future, we're working on safe Linux. 
And as part of doing that, if you had the ability to have, you know, upstreaming of your drivers, for example, you could have a much wider set of contributions from uh, the community. And that could really benefit every layer of, of the stack. Um, the other thing that will allow a broader set of contribution, as I mentioned, part of the software defined vehicle is creating this service oriented architecture. And the idea of that is to offer APIs that then allow developers in the cloud to add just rich applications that can mine the data that's from the car and offer all kinds of differentiated capabilities. And so, you know, there's just many, many opportunities where if you open up this platform so that a wider set of people can contribute and deliver applications, you'll see a much richer experience. And part of that is what you see on, on the smartphone today where, you know, very easy to add new applications. That's been much harder in the car. Uh, and part of that is because you don't have standardized software infrastructure in the vehicles. Every OEM has something different. And so it makes it very difficult to get development scale. Every OEM is going out and trying to build out their own ecosystem with applications and, and all of that, which is very difficult. Yeah, second question, you mentioned there was 60 countries where you're doing pilot testing. How many of those countries are in Africa? I don't know the details on every every country, but that's a good question. I have to get back to you on that. OK, thank you. Hi, I have a question uh, for the um, for the ADAS, especially L2 and above. Do you do the training for the uh, for, for the features for the navigation and so on? Or does the OEM do it and, the, and do you regionalize also? Yeah, so it's it's kind of a mix on the Drive policy stack that I mentioned, the collaboration with BMW, we're owning the training and the productization of the camera perception stack. And then we're collaborating with BMW for the productization of the rest of the autonomous driving stack, which includes the, the drive policy and the motion control. Jeremiah, I want to say thank you. This is an excellent presentation. I'm over here. Um, one of the key questions in my mind, especially talking about the ADAS systems, where are the sensors for, like you said, inclement weather or any of the sensors required for road surface type of conditions? If anyone has driven around here and I lost the entire suspension yeah. system on Miramar, um, is there a set of sensors that you're contemplating integrating into the Polton drive or ride? Yeah. SOCs to be able to address things such as potholes or metal plates that have come loose or even inclement weather? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I wouldn't say necessarily that there's sensors that are specifically mounted with that in mind. So, you know, you could imagine you could even have a downward facing sensor that would be more optimal for that. Um, but right now, I think you'd be trying to do that with the sensors in the, in the placement that they are. And you'd be able to have some visibility to that, but not as good as, as if you did a placement specifically targeted for that. Um, or very interesting comment, by the way. There's uh, research groups that actually have precise positioning uh, technology that's actually based on digital signature of the asphalt on the road. And uh, you can imagine that sensor is facing down and it would do exactly what you're talking about. It would have a very good idea of uh, potholes and that. Kind right, of if thing. you have the resolution and the distance, because obviously yeah. as your speeds increase, obviously these things have to. Yeah, yeah. A little more quickly. One other question. Um, I worked with the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute. Um, is there a lot of these safety features being driven through that process, whereby the the safety features are, quote unquote, qualified like you would for any SOC? Yeah. So a lot of the uh, Standardization right now is we have these ASOL ratings that are actually used to quantify the robustness of the safety process and the reliability of the silicon. Um, and then the system design. So does your stack architecture have comprehended all the corner cases and does it have ways to mitigate error conditions that, that could happen? Uh, in terms of unifying autonomous driving and all that, it's, it's really mostly the Wild West out there right now. I mean, there's a lot of initiatives. I think if you follow the news, you know, there's a lot of consternation. What do we do about this stuff? Is it regulated enough? Uh, that'll have to play itself out. Uh, but really, there isn't a lot of regulation. There is some, like, for example, when we started our highway pilot, 
we have to have a license with the state of California. And we have to basically monitor the disengagements. So every time we drive, we have to be logging and we have a safety driver. And if there's any disengagement, you know, we track that. Very good, thank you. Thanks, Jeremiah, for very interesting presentation. <laughs> Things have certainly come long ways in the last few years, for sure. Uh, for these different cars manufactured by different companies to talk to each other, interconnect and so on, there needs to be lots of common standardization of how they talk, how they, what kind of protocols and what is happening. Yeah. Is that happening somewhere? If yes, then where is that happening? Yeah, so for the Vita X specifically, uh, the ITS SAE committees have the stack guidelines for that. And so there is some kind of uh, standardization around that. That's and we've done a lot of interop testing, you know, over the years. That's the stack level. How about all other levels? Uh, they're working on it? Um, yeah, so basically they would communicate the, uh, a lot of what these uh, interactions are doing is communicating the location of the car, the speed, you know, whether I'm turning lanes and all that. So there is a defined protocol for, for communicating all of that. Um, the next layer, uh, and this is a little bit far of, of the next set of things which aren't maybe totally established is what you could call collaborative driving. So what happens, for example, at a four way stop when everybody arrives at the same time and nobody knows who should go next? So, you know, there's early standardization on those collaborative driving, but that's a little bit more in the early stages. OK, thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for um given a great talk. Um, as a co-host from the Co Communications Society, I'd like to thank you again. And apologies, I was a bit late. I have work to do to get in here. But um, so you gave us good insights on what's happening around this uh, sphere inside the car. But the real upcoming time schedule changes around the car are the, um, the transformation to all electric. And so it, could you give an insight? Will you be able to have a follow on to telling us actually how soon are those changes are going to come? Because those changes are mandated in many regions, right? You have to do that. Uh, all, all this stuff on car safety, it's all good. Good engineering, good all that, but th there's strict requirements on energy and power. And then obviously the other one from the last talk was we have all this communication data. Yeah, how's that going to turn out? Yeah, yeah. So the electrification pace is obviously different around the world. Like I mentioned, uh, we were in China in, in May and there it's happening at a very rapid rate, partly because there's large government incentives for, for the electrification. And, and there you actually see that the electric cars may be even cheaper than the combustion engine. And so I believe in the recent sales, over 50% of the vehicles being sold are electric. Um, you see much slower adoption over the other regions, uh, partly because in the US, for example, an electric car still costs quite a bit more. Uh, and that's a big barrier for, for some people. Um, on the other hand, the electric cars, as we've seen, have very advanced features. They're much more software defined to begin with. So I think it's just a matter of time before you'll see uh, a speed up on that. And uh, part of the reason I didn't focus too much on that is for the areas we work in, it's a little bit independent of whether it's electric or not. Uh, but the electric cars do bring certain changes as well. So for example, if you look at the really high-end features of, of ADAS, uh, it used to be in the past that, you know, uh, power budgets were a big issue and, and people said, you know, no way I'll ever use liquid cooling because in a combustion engine, that would be a big adder to the car. Uh, but in an electric vehicle, they probably already have liquid cooling already to begin with. So that becomes a very natural extension uh, and it becomes much easier to add really high compute with larger power budgets. So that's one area where we're seeing some interplay with some of the things that, that we're doing. Um, but it'll be interesting to watch and uh, it definitely will, will depend region by region on what happens in terms of incentives and you know, those types of issues. Great, uh, follow on question. So uh, the other one I'd like to see from you guys later on, it, oh, this is great in 2D, 
automatic, but as we move to aerial, so the other open space of development is aerial vehicles, right? So uh, if you can save that one, that'd be another. Okay. Because weight matters, right? Yeah. Weight matters. So all this engine is great, but uh, with all the metal you throw around it, but when you have to lift, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Has has Qualcomm considered a thermal imaging night vision for adverse conditions or even road conditions? As the question was asked previously. Yeah. A certain um, you know road conditions like metal plates would definitely stand out with a different uh, heat signature compared to asphalt. And yeah. Even look through snow. As far as thermal imaging sensors for for night vision and all that, uh, there's obviously been a lot of companies that have invested in that and. Uh, the issue right now is we really haven't seen the proliferation of that enough where it was uh, became cost effective enough that it, it really gained scale. And one of the issues that's been happening at the same time is with the high dynamic range CMOS sensors. Those are actually starting to do much better uh, in low light conditions as well. So, so far we haven't seen really any major mass adoption of, of the thermal sensors, you know, in, in the mainstream cars. Is, is a cost issue that you mentioned that that, that is a primary uh, factor would be cost? It's it's one of the factors and really just the, the scale of production and, and all those issues and the fact that uh, as the CMOS sensors get better, uh, most of these systems are able to run fairly well with, with the standard imaging sensors. Okay. Do you think um, wireless charging of EVs via roadway is coming anytime soon and what do you think are the major challenges of that is that mostly power distribution problem or, or smart car coordination with the uh, power system or, or yeah what? yeah I don't have too much visibility on that to, to comment but uh, you know obviously Qualcomm had a acquisition in wireless uh, charging before and you know not one that's gotten wide mainstream adoption, but let's see how it plays out, you know, over time. Thank you, let's uh, thank Jeremiah next. <laughs> give this to you on behalf of the San Diego section. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, We have a final video uh, of the concept car, and after the video, uh, if we sorry. oh yeah, sorry, we we have a final video of the concept car, and after that, uh, we have a live demo in the lobby out there. So if we can all head out, uh, there's uh, an engineer there who will uh, demo the car for us. Thanks a lot. Thanks again. This is our Snapdragon digital chassis concept vehicle and we're showcasing the technologies that we have for automotive here. So the first thing that happens is it's scanning my face right now and then it's going to load all my preferences based on my driver profile. So you'll notice the lighting change. Uh, my seat position was adjusted, and it also played my favorite genre of music, which is all loaded in the driver profile. This year, we partnered with Unreal Engine, which is a 3D game engine, and they've really uh, enhanced our UI to a whole new level. So you have things like this drive mode here. Uh, now, maybe if you switch from comfort to sport, that's reflected in the UI. Now I've opened our climate app, and you can either adjust it with touch or by voice. Hey, Snapdragon. It's hot in here. Decreasing temperature by 4 Fahrenheit. Now I'm going to open navigation and set the car into drive. What you're seeing here is a video we recorded here in Munich with one of our vehicles we use for autonomous driving. You'll notice that on the cluster we have some 3D objects. What's happening here is we've taken all the sensor data and all the objects that our vehicles can detect and we're rendering it in 3D on the cluster so that you can line it up with a video and see all the objects that we're detecting. Now with that, I'm going to get started with my day. Hey, Snapdragon. What's my day look like? I see a reminder for your brother's birthday today. Plans to cook for the neighborhood kids tonight. And you have a doctor's appointment in 30 minutes. 
looking at the traffic. You need to start driving to your appointment. Do you want to? Yes. By the way, I see a business dinner tomorrow at 7 p.m. with Nackle. Would you like me to help with this? Find me some restaurants nearby. Here are several restaurants. Show me only the ones with outdoor seating. Here are several restaurants that have outdoor seating. Make a reservation for four people at the second one. I made the reservation for four people at Caruso 6 p.m. So what you just saw there was our uh, one of our generative AI demos, which showcases uh, our integration work with their software. And now you can uh, search for POIs and also, uh, also filter it down to more preferred options like outdoor seating, places with a nice wine list, etc. So another thing we like to show people is uh, our connected services demonstration. So maybe you have an error code in your car, such as an AC system performance warning. Not only can you search for service stations nearby through the cloud, but you can also make appointments to have your car serviced. Next, we're going to go on a little tour of the city. Hey, Snapdragon. Enable tour mode. I have created a route with three places to drive by. Liptothick History Museum, Toy Museum Munich, and Hopper House Munchen. While driving, I am drawing a unique image and pulling up a short description about each one of them for you. Finally, we like to end the demo with something fun. So I'm going to put the car into park. And now that we're safely parked, I'm going to open up our video game. And we can enjoy our full screen video game, taking over the instrument cluster as well. Thank you.